Okay, guys, how are you? Just pray again for the internet connection and the buffering, that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the internet runs smoothly for the glory of Jesus Christ. Good to see you. Good to see you. Chaldean, how are you? Basma Ganu. Me, Chaldean? I wonder why. Why would you say that? Basma Ganu. Sa El Noom. I like this guy's name. Sa El Noom. Marcy, good to see you. Really blesses me to see all, all you regular faces and new folks, and Marcy especially. I like to see her. I thank Jesus Christ that he's pleased to use me to bless you, Marcy, and bless everyone. As I've said, I'll say it again, the Lord Jesus doesn't need me. The Lord Jesus doesn't need anyone, to be quite frank. So it is a honor, privilege, a blessing, purely grace that the Lord Jesus would use someone like me and anyone else, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to finish the discussion we began yesterday, the question. Lord Jesus willing, what I want to do is provide the most comprehensive answer to the question, the most comprehensive answer to the question, why did Jesus Christ, our Lord, not know the day or hour? So <clears throat> when I'm done with this session, I'm going to put in the title of the discussion, live Q&A with the Assyrian Encyclopedia, why doesn't the son know that there are part two? So that when people now ask me, if Jesus is God, why is it he did not know that there are? I can then point them to these two sessions and they can go and listen to them and see my very thorough response by the grace of the triune God, by the grace of the Father, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, right? And then if we have time, we'll open up, you know, to other questions and this is what i love about act 17 apologetics hater wood he knows when i go live he'll come in he'll do a hit and run he'll take shots and then disappear he does that every day now if he were just to sit long enough and listen maybe he would learn sound theology maybe he would learn how to interpret the bible and not be so heretical right darn it anyway let me share some links with you guys links I copy and pasted the article from the Jews for Jesus website regarding an objection you'll, you'll often hear by those who oppose Jesus as the Messiah, specifically rabbinic Jews, right? They'll tell you that some of the prophecies that we point to in reference to Jesus being the Messiah, they're past tense because the verbs are past tense and because those chapters are speaking of an event that's in the past, that's already taken place, it can't be referring to the future. Because of that, I decided to copy and paste the Jews for Jesus article on this, refuting this, showing that just because, and again, I need you to listen to this because I'm gonna give you the link. Just because the Old Testament speaks of an event in the past, uses past tense verbs, <clears throat> signifying that the event that's being discussed and recorded has already transpired, that doesn't mean it's not referring to something that will take place in the future because the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, the Hebrew of the Old Testament <clears throat> is an aspectual language. In other words, you don't look at the tense of the verb. You look at how that verb is being used in the context so that the unique feature of the Hebrew of the Old Testament is that you may have a passage that uses past tense verbs, but it may be referring to a pre present situation or a future reality. So be careful of the argument raised by many rabbinic Jews dishonestly because they should know the Old Testament because they know the language of the Old Testament. They know Hebrew. Beware of the argument that says that prophecies, let's say like Isaiah 9, because it uses the past, past tense, right? A child has been born. A son has been given. It can't be future. They know better, and they're trying to pull a fast one. So here's the link. Here's the link to that. And this article from Jews for Jesus also cite not just scholarly sources on how the Hebrew of the Old Testament works and how these verbs work, but they also cite specific rabbis confirming this very fact. So by the grace of Jesus Christ, save this link. Study it and use it. It's from the Jews for, for Jesus website. I copy and pasted it 
just in case that website shuts down. God forbid. I pray it doesn't shut down. So that's the first article. Another article I want you to save and study is the one I published yesterday. More of the incomplete Quran exposed. Who or what is Ahmed? I started a series of articles demonstrating that the Quran is an incoherent, unintelligible piece of Babel, right? It is incoherent Babel, incoherent mishmash. The Quran claims to be a scripture that's fully detailed, and yet the Quran fails to provide sufficient details in order to understand much of its content. So I started a series of articles asking Muslims questions to answer using the Quran alone, which they cannot do, thereby proving the Quran is a lie, Muhammad is a false prophet, an antichrist, an agent of Satan. May the Lord Jesus wipe his name from the earth and save Muslims from Islam and bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ. So here, here's the link to that. Who or what is Ahmed? Please click on that link, save these articles, study them, pass them on for the glory of Jesus Christ. Who or what is Ahmed? And if you want me to explain why the title, who or what is Ahmed, ask me a little later when I finish responding to the question, why is it that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not know the day or hour or did not know the day or hour? There goes the link. And then one more article. I wrote a post not too long ago, and I shared it because I did a series on this not too long ago. I think maybe, what, two weeks ago? Whose glory did the prophet Isaiah see in Isaiah 6? Because in Isaiah 6, it says, Isaiah saw Jehovah seated on a throne, and he says, My eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. And so Isaiah saw Jehovah, saw the glory of Jehovah filling the earth. And according to the New Testament, according to the Gospel of John, John 12, verses 37 to 41, the glory of Jehovah that Isaiah beheld, the Jehovah who appeared visibly to Isaiah, was none other than Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence, according to the Gospel of John. So that Jesus is Jehovah Almighty. Here's the article. Save these links, folks. And remind me to give you links <clears throat> that I've to articles that I've written discussing this question. Why is it that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not know the dear hour? So these are the links I want you to save. Links to the articles and rebuttals that I want you to study, use, and pass on for the glory of Jesus Christ. Make use of the material. Go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. That's the blog I started. It's not the best-looking blog, but hey, it's free, and it gets the job done. Because we're not looking for beauty. We're looking for content, solid content, solid information, solid facts, battle-tested arguments, tested in spiritual battle by the power of the Holy Spirit, perfected by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that you can win Muslims, you can atheists, agnostics, you name it, and take them captive for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? So answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, and make sure also to go to answeringislam.net, answeringislam.net, the most comprehensive website refuting Islam, defending Christianity against Islam. Go to individual authors, look for Sam Shamoon, and find my articles. I have nearly 200, if not more, I think I have over 200 articles. I don't know. I haven't counted. It doesn't matter. Articles and rebuttals where I provide thorough, thorough refutations of the major attacks against the core doctrines of the Christian faith by Muslims and thorough critiques of Islam, why Muhammad is a false prophet. And I'm not the only author. There are many outstanding authors on that website. Check out Anthony Rogers. So all glory to the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Can't I compress them into a book form in time. Now, pray that the regular show up and pray that we'll be filled with the Spirit. Pray this will be anointed. Pray you'll be blown away. Pray that the Holy Spirit will use me <clears throat> to cause us to form, fall more passionately in love with the triune God, to stand more in awe of the triune God and His Word. Well, this is my Spirit, right? So if you guys are ready, I'm ready to begin finishing my response to the question, why is it that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not know the day or hour? So I'm going to make this the most thorough response to this question. And it's now going to be archived on my YouTube channel 
so that I'll just point to people, or you can point to people, or you can download these sessions. <clears throat> use the arguments, use the passages, educate Christians. And this, this is what I want. I really want you to do this. Learn the arguments. In Jesus' name, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. In Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus Christ covering us and washing us. Holy Spirit filling us and blessing us. In Jesus' name. Hopefully we don't get... Hopefully we don't get problems with the Internet. I want you to take this information. Use this information. Download the articles to your own websites or the videos to your YouTube channels. And... and <clears throat> Disseminate this information and pass it on and use it in your Bible studies. Use it in your Sunday schools. If you want to do a sermon, use this information. Multiply it because we need Christians to be educated. Look at you guys. When you hear this information, doesn't it blow you away? Doesn't it ignite a fire in your hearts? Doesn't it make you stand in awe of how amazing and beautiful the Bible is? Doesn't it cause you, cause you to just stand in wonder and amazement of how real Jesus is, how real the triumph God is, and how amazing and lovable and beautiful the triumph God is, right? Don't you want other Christians also to experience that? Don't you want other Christians to experience that? Christians who do not know the gift they have in the Holy Bible. That God has given us a book that's supernatural, divine, and origin. It is his voice to us. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit, when he illuminates you and opens your eyes and your hearts and minds to understand the depth of this word, you walk away in awe, mesmerized, blown away of how real the God of this book is and how amazing Jesus is. And we want all Christians to see that, taste that, to taste and see how unbelievably good Jehovah is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? So with that said, let's begin. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you and we confess you're the Father, Son, his beloved, his heart become flesh, the eternal word. Holy Spirit, we love you and we depend on you and we need you. Holy Spirit, seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Perfect us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Transform us to conform to the image of the Father's firstborn Son, the Lord Jesus. Crucify our flesh. Save us from the stain of our flesh, from the lust of our flesh. Give us the power to die to our flesh, to conquer our flesh, and to walk in your life, Holy Spirit. In your power, in your majesty. Fill us with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your presence, Holy Spirit. With your life, with your love. Fill us to overflowing for the glory of Jesus. For the sake of Jesus. And please, Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue to speak truth without error. Enable me to recall scripture and interpret it correctly and perfectly by your power. Purify my motives not to do it for the praise of men. I'm wicked and tainted and I need you to cleanse me. I need you to cleanse all of us. We need you to purify every one of us in the holy blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. Purify my motives not to do it for the praise of men and save me from unrighteous anger. And bless your people, Holy Spirit, those united to Jesus Christ. And convict those who have yet to be united to Jesus, to know Jesus and fall in love with Jesus. And empower us, please, Holy Spirit. And please, Holy Spirit, be with our loved ones. Be with my daughter. Seal them and wash them in the blood of Jesus and perfect them and preserve them. Bless the internet connection. Strengthen the internet connectivity, and please, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Save me from stammering and confusion. Bless everyone with the understanding to know the depth of Scripture. Please, Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit, fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, your breath of life, to do this for the glory of Jesus. We love you. We love you, Abba, and we love you, Lord Jesus. Have your way in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yeah, Abba, Father, Holy Spirit. I am drinking, it's called ice. It's water, flavored water, and it's filled with antioxidants. I don't know if that's good or not. Anyway, and may the Lord Jesus beatify me to be pleasing to his church, to the children of God. <clears throat> okay, with that said, 
We're going to continue from where we left off yesterday. I'm going to provide a very comprehensive answer to the question, why is it that Jesus Christ, the Son, does not know the dare hour? We spent a lot of the time in Matthew. Lord willing, I'm going to spend most of the time in Mark. And hopefully I'll have some time for other questions. But I've made a commitment and I promised, right, that this entire week I'm just going to do live Q&A. For this whole week, if the Lord Jesus is pleased, Lord willing, the triumph God willing, I'm just going to do live Q&A and take your questions and trust the Spirit to guide me to answer any question that the Spirit wants me to answer at that moment, right? So don't despair if I don't get to your questions. And by the way, some rules to help me to help you. It's a good reminder. Try to stay focused on the topic. Don't engage side issues or side debates and allow people to distract you because then you are robbing yourself from understanding the meat of these subjects. So I'm, I'm doing it out of love for you. I want you to understand this thoroughly and absorb it thoroughly and then be able to use it perfectly for the glory of God. And when I'm answering a question, withhold your questions. Write them down because if I'm trying to answer a question, I'm not done answering it, it then makes no point to bring up another question that's not related to the topic. So help me to help you for the glory of Jesus, right? To make the most of the sessions. And again, praise the Lord for the mods who help me to help you, who serve me to serve you and do it for the sake of Jesus because they don't get paid. Like Protestant believer, he don't get paid. I pay him nothing for nothing. And that's why I'm so tough with him because he gets paid nothing. And that is like, Really valuable nothing. Whenever he drops the ball, you know, I just like to tear him to shreds, right? But anyway, just kidding. Yeah, and do hit the like button. We got about 106. Come on now. In Jesus' name, I want to get that over 200. 200 and going and going and going. Let's look at Mark 13, verse 32. Mark 13, verse 32. Pray for me to do justice to this topic and that the Spirit will use me to strengthen you for the glory of Christ. Mark 13, 32. Here's the passage. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. So why is it Jesus Christ, our Lord, did not know the dare hour if he is fully God, essentially God, meaning he possesses all the essential attributes of deity, that which makes God God, Jesus fully possesses, and Jesus is equal to the Father. Now, pay attention to this. Pay attention. Jesus is equal to the Father in essence, in their common nature, because they both possess the common nature of deity. In glory, he's equal to the Father in glory, in majesty, in honor, in praise. Okay? So if that's the case, how is it that the Son doesn't know everything the Father knows? How is it that the Father knows something the Son doesn't know? So this is what we're going to continue explaining, explicating by the grace of the Holy Spirit, with the wisdom from the Spirit, trusting the Spirit to save me from error. Remember what I said yesterday, though, in the case of Matthew, because this is also found in Matthew, Matthew 24, 36. Mark 13, verse 32, is near the end of Mark. Mark has already written 12 chapters Previous to Mark 13.32. In other words, before you get to Mark 13.32, you must have read Mark chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and so on before you got to Mark 13. So Mark, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has already told us so much about who Jesus is, what Jesus is, and the things Jesus has done. Before he got to Mark 13, 32. So what's my point? You do not interpret scripture by going into a book and looking for a passage in the middle of the book or near the end of the book and taking that verse out of context and ignoring all that came before it and all that comes after it. Mark 13, 32 is near the end of Mark. Mark has 16 chapters. Mark 13 is near the end. It's nowhere near the beginning. Mark has already gone out of his way to tell us who Jesus is and has shown us who Jesus is by the things that Jesus has said and done before he's gotten to Mark 13, 32. Everyone with me there? You understand 
how not to interpret the Bible, understand how to interpret the Bible. So in these sessions, I'm trusting the Spirit to enable me to teach you how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible, understand all the different literary features of the Bible, hyperbole, simile, right? <clears throat> Allegory, metaphor, right? Parallelism, et cetera, et cetera. As the Spirit teaches me, and teaches you through me for the glory of Jesus. So I want you to learn how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret the Bible. One way that you do not interpret the Bible is by going to a book and finding the verse in the middle of the book or near the end of the book and try to build the doctrine from that one single verse or statement or passage and ignoring the relationship that verse, that statement has to all that came before it and all that comes after it. So I'm going to sound like a broken record because I know I speak fast. So I like to repeat myself at least twice, if not three times or more, because I know we need to hear things repetitively until it sinks in and becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. So are you getting it thus far? Right? Is it making sense? If someone's confused, just say, look, uh, I'm still not getting it. That's fine. I will work with you. That's why I'm not rushing. Okay. And I'm not Russian. I'm a Syrian. Exactly, Andrew Martin. In other words, don't be like a Muslim apologist, precisely. So if everyone's getting that point, if I want to know what Mark meant in Mark 13, 32, I don't start in Mark 13. I'm going to start in Mark 1. So are you now ready to embark on a journey with me to explore the theme of Mark's gospel? Why did Mark write the gospel? He tells you in chapter 1. We're going to look at the first four verses of chapter 1. Okay? Well, I'm nobody's boss. Jesus is our boss. He's our God. He's our Lord. And we answer to him. If I was your boss, medic, I'd have to pay you. In reality, you need to pay me. No, I'm kidding. All right, Mark 1, 1 to 4. Let's read. Read with me, folks. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Pay attention to the wording. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You got to read attentively and ask the Spirit to illuminate you to absorb what you're reading. Okay. Notice verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So let me unpack the first four verses. Mark says that he is <clears throat> writing about the good news of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And then he says, as it is written in the prophets. What is Mark trying to tell us? Mark is trying to tell us that this gospel that I'm recording for you, this gospel that I'm writing down, was already announced, prophesied, proclaimed beforehand in the Hebrew Bible. So I am recording, writing down the fulfillment of the prophetic word, the fulfillment of those prophecies that announce this gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Exactly, CJ. You with me there? Point number one. Mark is trying to tell us I'm recording what was already announced, foretold in the Old Testament. See, the Old Testament prophets, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, announce these things, announce these days, announce the coming of Jesus, the Son of God, proclaim this good news, and I'm recording the fulfillment of their prophecy. So far, are you with me? Are you with me there? Okay, he cites two passages. In Mark 1, verse 2, he cites Malachi 3, verse 1. Mark 1, verse 2, he cites Malachi 3, chapter 3, verse 1. And in Mark 1, verse 3, he cites Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Now let's look at those two prophecies. Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 2. Mark chapter 1, verse 2. And compare it to Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Mark 1, verse 2, and Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. 
Okay. Let's see what he cited. Okay, let's go. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Okay? Before, which shall prepare thy way before thee. This is a quotation of Malachi 3, verse 1. Let's unpack it. Let's unpack the prophecy. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith Jehovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts. Now, Mark says Malachi 3.1 was fulfilled. How was it fulfilled? When John the Baptist showed up. Okay, now let me make the connection. Notice again Malachi 3.1. Guys, I really need you to pay attention to make sure I'm not losing any of you. Malachi 3 verse 1. Here it says that... Jehovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts, is going to send a messenger, an envoy, an emissary to prepare the way before him, a messenger before me. Me is Jehovah speaking. So messenger is going to come. He's going to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Because notice it says, when the messenger comes, then suddenly the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple. Pay attention to those two points. A messenger will be sent to prepare for the appearance of coming of the Lord to his temple. The Lord, his temple. Now, the Hebrew words for the Lord are ha-adan or ha-adon. Okay, ha-adon, ha-adan. Let me get you the link. So you know I'm not making this up. I already went through this before, but again, it's all interconnected. Sometimes we got to repeat the same thing over and over again. In all the different sessions here. So you can see it for yourself. Thank the Triune God for modern technology where you can get Bible programs for free online to help you understand the languages without even having to read the languages of the Bible. See, Abdel Halaj. Click there. Here's the link. It gives you the Hebrew words in English transliteration. You're going to see it says, Ha. Let me see how it transliterates Adon. I translate it a little differently. Lepane. Lepane. Like that, my faces. Yeah, see, it translates it differently. Ha Adon. Okay. You're going to see this. You're going to see Ha Adon. That's two words. Ha Adon, Ha Adon. Before I proceed any further, make sure you click on it and you see those two words. The Lord. Ha Adon. I'm going to go very slow because I'm unpacking Mark. This is all related to understanding Mark's Christology, his portrait of Jesus Christ. Okay? Just let me know you, you get it before I move on because I'm going to show you. Now, some of you have been following me for a while. should remember this information because we br brought this up less than two weeks ago in my response to Chris Lasala, that heretic. So did everyone see it says Ha Adon? All right, now. Keep this in mind. Ha Adon, two words. Ha, the Adon, Lord, Ha Adon. This expression, these two words are never used for anyone other than Jehovah. Let me repeat so you don't misunderstand my point. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say the word Adon is never used for anyone except Jehovah. I didn't say that. Listen carefully. The words ha adon, when you have the definite article ha before the word adon, ha adon, ha adon, that phrase, those words are only used of Jehovah and never used for anyone else. And I'll give you an example. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 24, as Protestant post Isaiah 1, 24, See, now you have Abd al-Halij. He reads Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, and he's confirming what I'm saying. He reads the Hebrew, so he's saying amen. He'd be the first to correct me if I'm wrong. Now notice Isaiah 124. Therefore saith the Lord. Guess what the Hebrew is? Therefore saith the Lord. Therefore saith Ha-Adon, Jehovah of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Guys, click on that link. Verify for yourselves that the word the Lord in Isaiah 124, therefore saith the Lord, 
Ha'adon. And who is the Lord? Jehovah of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. The words Ha'adon, Ha'adon, are only used of Jehovah. Are only used of Jehovah. They're never used for anyone else. Guys, confirm it. I just gave you the link. In Jesus' name, God. Everyone see that? Okay. That's the first point if you see it. Malachi 3.1 says, Ha'adon is coming to his temple. Ha'adon is coming to his temple. The second point to keep in mind. According to the Old Testament and the New Testament, the temple in Jerusalem is the house of Jehovah God Almighty. It's the temple, the palace built for God, not for man. It is Jehovah's temple. First Chronicles 29 verse 1. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. Okay. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. Watch here. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen is yet young and tender. And the work is great. For the palace, the temple that he's building in Jerusalem, is not for man, but for Jehovah God. Now, did you see that? The temple in Jerusalem, the first temple and the second temple, they were not built for man. They were built for God. They are the palace of God, the house of God, the house of Jehovah. Let me show you that in Haggai chapter 1. It's a long one. We're going to read Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So read slowly, because Haggai is now talking about the rebuilding of the second temple. The Jews had returned from Babylonian captivity, from exile, right? And now they were commissioned to rebuild the house in Jerusalem. That's the second temple that Jesus entered. That's the temple Malachi 3.1 is referring to, the second temple. Now read, read. Haggai 1, verses 111, and thank Protestant for so patiently enduring and posting for us, making my job easier. Lord bless him and his household. Lord bless all of you. Read, the second temple in Jerusalem. Was that built for man, a creature, or for Jehovah God? Watch. In the second year of Darius the king, that's the Persian king, the Persian Medus king. In the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of Jehovah by Haggai the prophet. Unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of jo Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh Jehovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that Jehovah's house should be built. It's not time to build his house in Jerusalem, the Lord's house. Now notice what Jehovah did. Notice how he disciplined them for ignoring his home, for failing to rebuild his home in Jerusalem when they returned from Babylon. Notice what he did to them. Okay. Then came the word of Jehovah the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying. <clears throat> Let's read from four. Sorry. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? So, oh, it's not time for you to rebuild my house, but it's time for you to live in your sealed homes, huh? So you're all busy about getting you homes, buying you homes, building you homes to live in. But who cares about my house? Really? That's your attitude? Spirit, bless this connection. Rebuke the evil one, Lord. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. I'm sorry. Sixteen, eleven. look up a dictionary what sealed is. I mean, I can give you the Hebrew word. That's the King James for you, buddy. Sealed, I would, uh, anyway, figure it out. Let's, let's read. Let's go back. I lost, I got buffered. Is it time for you, for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now, therefore, thus saith Jehovah of hosts, consider your ways, consider your ways. You have so much. Notice the punishment that has befallen you. Notice the discipline that's befallen you. For being busy building your houses, but ignoring my home. Watch. Pay attention. You have sown much and bring in little. You've sown much and you've reaped little. You eat, 
but you have enough, not enough. You don't have enough to eat. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe, we, you clothe you, you clothe yourselves, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, I'm about to smash this connection. Yeah, I'm Jesus, my flesh. Yeah. Sometimes this connection gets me angry. Okay, sorry. Let's read verse six. You have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, you clothe yourselves, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. A bag with holes is, imagine you have a purse, but there's holes. Your money keeps falling out. No matter how much money you make, it's never enough. No matter how much clothes you put on, it's not enough. No matter how much food you eat, it's not enough. You're never satisfied. It's never enough. Why? Why? Let's see why. Verse 7. Let's read. Pick it up at 7. Thus say, Jehovah of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, say Jehovah. Ye look for much, and lo, it, it came to little. It became little. You wanted a lot, but you got little in return. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. I destroyed everything that you work for, everything that you stored up. I didn't bless the work of your hands. I cursed the work of your hands. Why? Why did you do that, God? Why would you do that to your people? Watch here. Why, saith Jehovah's, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew. I didn't let it rain upon that which you have sown. So you didn't reap much. I withheld the rain, and the earth has stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, right? Upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Did you guys catch it? Do you guys catch it? Why weren't they blessed economically? Why weren't they blessed socially and politically and financially? Because they ignored God's house in Jerusalem. They ignored God's house in Jerusalem. They were all busy building their homes, buying homes for themselves, beatifying their homes. But they ignored the house of Jehovah. Everyone got it? I'm going to now tie it in. Because remember, everything in the Bible has an application for us today. We have to see how those passages apply to believers today. Right? Isn't it sad? And I'm not trying to preach, but as the Holy Spirit leads for the glory of Christ... Isn't it sad? You have people, and I see them all around me, busy buying homes that are worth $400,000, $500,000, $300,000, working day and night, putting in overtime, even ignoring the fellowshipping with other brothers and sisters, neglecting to meet and assemble with brothers and sisters, and storing up money to get bigger homes, or to beatify their homes, to get more expensive couches and beds and TVs and cars and clothes, and yet could care less about the house of God, the people of God, the work of God, the ministers of God. You catch it now? You see? Nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. They were doing it back then. God's people ignored God's house. They go, oh, it's not time for God's house. God doesn't need a place to dwell in. God is omnipresent. So he'll understand while we delay rebuilding the temple where his presence would dwell in a unique way as a sign that he's with us and we are his people. He'll understand. He'll understand that our homes are more important. Our livelihood takes a priority. And God says, oh, really? That's why the more you work, the less you have. 
The more you eat, the less you're satisfied. The more you drink, the more you thirst because I am cursing the work of your hands and cursing <clears throat> your livelihood and cursing the ground and cursing the cattle, stock, uh, the, the cattle, the livestock, so that the more you work, the less you have in return. However, if you focus on me, put me first, put my house first, seek me first, all these things will be added to you. Yet the law of diminishing returns. Matthew 6, 33. All of what Jehovah said in Haggai 1 is stated by Jesus succinctly in Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see? Jesus sums up the point of Haggai 1. Make God number one in your life. Make his will number one in your life. Seek his pleasure. Seek his glory. Seek his happiness. And that which delights his heart and everything else will follow. Clear? So I'm not just giving you head knowledge. God forbid. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray the things we learn will impact us and penetrate the depth of our souls, our minds, and our hearts. Transform us to be even more on fire for Jesus, more in love with Jesus. And the Spirit will take us to a higher level of devotion and sacrifice. Right? Is that clear? And may God purify my motives never to use this for selfish gain or for self-glory. But folks, understand the implication of this. It's not that God wants you to starve and be homeless and wants your children to suffer. No, no, no. That's the opposite. God is saying, trust me. Seek me first. Seek my will, my pleasure, what makes me happy. Put me number one in every area of your life. Make me first in your <clears throat> business, in your politics. Make me number one socially, politically, economically. In every sphere of your life, in the way you do politics, in the way you vote. Make me first. The way you work and where you work and how you work. Make me first. And I will bless you and preserve you and your children for my glory. Matthew 6, 33. So that's the point of Haggai 1. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. The same God who told the Israelites, because you ignored my house, my worship, my glory... I will ignore you, and I won't bless you socially, politically, economically. Right? Is that clear? Did that sink in? I just wanted to make that side point. But the, the main point, the point relevant to my discussion is, whose house is it in Haggai chapter 1? The temple in Jerusalem. Whose home was it? That home belonged to who? That home belonged to Jehovah, right? Okay. Now let's go to Malachi 3 verse 1. Malachi 3 verse 1. As the Lord anoints the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. Malachi 3 verse 1. Let's check it out again. It's Jehovah's home. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, ha Adan. Ha Adan, those words only used of Jehovah, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. The two lines of evidence proving that whoever this entity is, he's Jehovah God Almighty. He's called the Lord, Ha Adan, a phrase used only of Jehovah, and he'll be coming to his temple in Jerusalem, and the temple belongs to Jehovah. In other words, what Malachi 3.1 is saying is that a messenger will be sent to announce to the people that Jehovah is coming to his temple. The Lord Jehovah will appear in his temple. Get ready for him. You understand now what Malachi 3.1 is saying? You understand the prophecy? Okay, now, Mark chapter 1, verse 3, cross-reference with Isaiah 40. And dear, I think these sessions are too much for you, man. I think I'm going to have to send you on your merry way.
Yeah, I don't think you're ready for this kind of uh, session. Mark chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to cross-reference with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. Pay attention. Okay, now read the second prophecy. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Don't forget that second prophecy in Mark 1, 3. Because it's quoting Isaiah 40, verse 3. Pay attention. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. So you see where Mark is quoting from. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of Jehovah. Not a creature, not a human, not a spirit creature. Prepare the way for Jehovah, the God of Israel. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of Jehovah shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of Jehovah has spoken it. If he's spoken it, it's done. What God says, what God decrees will come to pass because there's no power in creation to stop God from doing what he wants. Okay, now what did Isaiah just say? Let it sink in. Isaiah said, a voice will cry out in the wilderness. This voice will shout out in the wilderness, folks, prepare for the way of Jehovah. Make a highway for our God. Folks, Jehovah our God is coming. Get ready. He's about to come. So notice the connection between Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3. What's the connection? Why did Mark quote these two passages? Because these two passages are talking about the same thing. Both passages are saying, an envoy, an emissary, a messenger will be sent to the wilderness. And that messenger will shout out in the wilderness, telling the people, get ready. Jehovah's coming. Our God is going to show up. The Lord is coming to his temple. Get ready, folks. He's about to appear. He's about to show up. Get ready for his coming. You got it now? What? These prophecies are saying, what's the connection between Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3? Let me repeat it again. What's the connection between Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3? This is the connection. Both prophets prophesied a messenger, an envoy would be sent to prepare the people, announce to the people, the Lord, Ha'adan, is going to come to his temple. You're about to see him. Get ready for Jehovah. Make a highway for our God because our God Jehovah is about to show up. Okay, did you get that thus far? Did it make sense what the prophecies are saying? A messenger shows up and after the messenger, Jehovah God Almighty is going to show up. A messenger comes, tells people Jehovah's showing up and right after the messenger, Jehovah shows up. Now let's see who that messenger is. Who that voice is that cries in the wilderness. Mark 1 verses 3 to 4. Mark 1 verses 3 to 4. Mark 1 verses 3 to 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Pay attention. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now Mark wants you to see the connection. He wants you to make the connection. Notice in verse 4. Not a coincidence. He says, John... Did baptize in the wilderness. Hmm. John is baptizing in the wilderness. And he's preaching in the wilderness. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John the Baptist is in the wilderness preaching. Preparing people to confess their sin and get ready. So wait. Hold on. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says. Whoever that one is in the wilderness. He's preparing people for our God to show up. He's preparing people for the coming of Jehovah. Mark says that voice is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1. That messenger who's preparing people for the coming of Ha'adan, the Lord, to his temple. You see what Mark did in the first chapter? He just introduced you to John the Baptist as the messenger of Malachi 3.1, the voice of Isaiah 40 verse 3, that one who is preparing people for the appearance of Jehovah God Almighty, for the coming of Jehovah God Almighty. But hold on. Mark 1 is speaking of John the Baptist as the forerunner to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist 
came to prepare people for Jesus. But according to the prophecies, John the Baptist came to pre prepare people for the coming of Jehovah. He was sent to prepare for Jehovah, Israel's God. He was sent to prepare for Ha'adan, the Lord, who'd come to his temple. But John the Baptist came to prepare people for Jesus. Mark, you're confusing me. Why am I confusing you? John the Baptist is sent to prepare for Jesus Christ, right? Yes, he came to prepare for Jesus Christ, as he's about to say, and I'm going to show you. But Mark, you just quoted two Old Testament prophecies, okay? You quoted Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40, verse 3. And you're telling us John the Baptist is the messenger of Malachi 3.1. Of course he is. And he's the voice crying out in the wilderness of Isaiah 40, verse 3. Absolutely, that's John the Baptist. But according to those prophecies, Mark, the one that the Baptist is preparing for is Jehovah. He's making a highway for Israel's God, a highway for our God, Israel's God. He's preparing for the Lord, Ha'adon, Adon, coming to his temple. And the phrase Ha'adon is only used of Jehovah, and the temple is built for Jehovah alone. So if John is that one, but John is preparing for the coming of Jesus, and yet John was actually fulfilling those promises that he comes to prepare for Jehovah God Almighty to come to his temple. What are you trying to tell us about Jesus, Mark? Who is Jesus to you? Oh, you still don't get it? Jesus is Ha'adan, the Lord, and the temple belongs to Jesus because Jesus is Jehovah, Israel's God in the flesh. And that's in the first chapter. He's begun his gospel by already preparing you and introducing you to Jesus as Jehovah God, the God of Israel. Did it sink in before I move on to the next point? Before I move on to the next point. But I'm going to get a little more confused. Mark 1.1 1, 1 with verse 11. Mark 1.1 1, 1 with verse 11. Mark chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 11. Okay, I'm going to get a little more confused. Okay. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then Mark 1.11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, now I'm really confused, Mark. You just told us Jesus is the Son of God. And God the Father from heaven announced in an audible voice that the Son and John the Baptist heard. Jesus is his beloved Son, the beloved Son of God the Father. And the Father delights in him. Yeah. So now Jesus is not God the Father. He's the Father's beloved Son in whom the Father delights. Yes. And in Mark 1.10, the Holy Spirit descended into Jesus as a dove. So Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. No, he's not. So Jesus is not the Father, and Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son of God, but yet Jesus is Jehovah. But I know the Father is Jehovah, and the Spirit is the eternal Spirit of Jehovah. And yet Jesus is not the Father. He's the Father's Son, but you just introduced him as Jehovah God of the Old Testament. So are you trying to tell me, Mark, that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is multipersonal? Is that why the church ended up becoming Trinitarian? Yeah, exactly. That's why. If you try to tell me who the Holy Spirit is and you go against Scripture, God's verse revealed truth, I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone. Did everyone get it? Okay, now let's prove John the Baptist is preparing for Jesus. Mark 1, verses 7 to 8. Mark 1, verses 7 to 8. Watch here. Mark 1, verses 7 to 8. Okay, Joel. Let me repeat for Joel. Listen. Joel, Mark 1, 1, 11 says, Jesus is the Son of God, and the Father's voice was heard audibly from heaven. John the Baptist heard the voice, and the Son heard it. And there, when Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism, the Father says, You are my beloved Son. You are the Son I love, in whom I delight. I'm well pleased. So that means Jesus is not the Father. He's the Father's Son. And in Mark 1.10, it says the Holy Spirit descended upon him, into him, as a dove. So then the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. So Jesus is not the Father. He's the beloved Son of God, whom the Father delights in. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. And yet we know the Father is Jehovah God. And we know the Holy Spirit is the eternal Spirit of Jehovah. 
and Jesus is the son of God. But Mark 1 began by introducing Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament who is to come. So hold on. If Jesus is Jehovah God of the Old Testament and he's not the father, right? he's not the father. Okay, hold on. He's not the father. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I'm Sheikh of Allah's spirit. In Jesus' name, Allah's spirit. All right. In Jesus' name. Sorry about that. He's not the father. Jesus is Jehovah God of the Old Testament, but he's not the father. And the father's Jehovah God as well. And there's only one Jehovah God. The father's Jehovah God, and the son of God is now identified as Jehovah God. So are you trying to tell me, Mark, that the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, is multipersonal, which is why the church came to the understanding that God is a trinity? Yeah. You understand what I just did now? Or what Mark did? Now, Mark 1, 7 to 8. Mark 1, 7 to 8. Watch here. Mark 1, 7 to 8. Watch what happens. And preaching, John the Baptist preaching, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now notice what John said about Jesus. I'm not good enough to be his slave. If you don't know a little bit about historical context, it was the function of servants, house servants, to loosen the sandals of the master or the members of the household or even guests and provide water to wash their feet. Are you with me there? You with me there? So it would be a servant who would stoop down, untie the latchets of a person's sandal, especially the, the Lord of the house, and provide water for his feet. What John just said is, he is so mighty, he is so great, this one, I'm not even good enough to be his slave. I'm not even good enough to do the work of a slave and untying his sandals because I'm not good enough to be his slave. That's how mighty and great he is. And he's so greater than me. I simply baptize in water. I immerse in water. He will immerse you within the Holy Spirit. That's how great he is. Here's my challenge to all anti-Trinitarian heretics and Unitarian blasphemers. Quote a single passage from the Hebrew Bible where someone other than Jehovah gives the Holy Spirit to his followers. Quote a passage in the Hebrew Bible where someone other than Jehovah God baptizes people, immerses people, pours out the Spirit upon people. You won't find it. The only one in the Hebrew Bible who gives the Holy Spirit to believers, who pours out the Holy Spirit upon believers, who immerses people in the presence of the Spirit is Jehovah God. And yet John the Baptist said, this one who's coming, who's mightier than me, and I'm unworthy to be a slave. He's too good for me, for me to be a slave. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But wait, John the Baptist. According to the Old Testament, it's Jehovah, Jehovah alone who gives the Spirit. Who are you trying to tell us Jesus is? Now, this is just the first 11 verses of Mark 1. Mark 1 comes long before Mark 13. Long before Mark 13, Mark 1 has gone out of its way. Mark in chapter 1 has gone out of his way by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to identify Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty of the Old Testament. Ha'adon, a phrase used only of Jehovah. He is that Ha'adon of Malachi 3.1 coming to his temple, a temple built for Jehovah God, not for a creature, not for a man. He is Jehovah of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Israel's God, whose glory all flesh would see. He's already identified Jesus in that manner in Mark 1 and also described Jesus as the Son of God who is now filled with the Holy Spirit and who will bless others by giving them the Holy Spirit. All of this in the first 11 verses of chapter 1. And yet, you're going to go to Mark 13, 32. Ignore all that came before Mark 13, 32. To try to prove that Jesus isn't God because he doesn't know the dare hour. Did you get it? Did it sink in before I move on to the next point?
See, I won't move on until this sinks in and you get it. So how honest is it? How honest is it for someone to quote Mark 13, 32 to deny the deity of Christ, knowing that Mark 13, 32 is the 13th chapter and ignoring all the previous chapters, everything Mark said from chapter one up to Mark 13, 32. How honest is it? Is this the way that God intends people to read his word? Is this the way that the spirit desires the body of Christ to understand the very books that the spirit has produced for our edification? But here's the problem. I'll tell you what the problem is. It's not so much with the anti-Trinitarians who are demonized and use of the devil to pervert scripture. Okay. The problem is with us. I'll tell you why with us. We're the ones letting them get away with murder by quoting Mark 13, 32 and trying to answer Mark 13, 32 without first saying, hold on, you really want to know what Mark 13, 32 means? Let's start at chapter one. Let's read chapter by chapter, verse by verse until we get to Mark 13, 32 to see what Mark has told us about Jesus. And then we can accurately understand, correctly interpret whether Mark 13, 32 denies that Jesus is God or Mark 13, 32 does nothing to deny and undermine the explicit overwhelming evidence that Mark has already given that Jesus is God in the flesh. You get it? Is that you with me so far, right? Before I move on? For the sake of time, I'm going to go to Mark 2 and make my case for Mark 2, and then we're going to explain Mark 13, 32. And then hopefully I'll have some, some time for additional questions, Lord willing. But this entire week, if God is pleased, the Lord blesses me and protects me from my trials. In Jesus' name, miraculous deliverance, Lord, even this week, Lord, and blesses my children and reunites me to them in Jesus' name. This entire week, I'll be doing live Q&A, one week of live Q&A. Okay, now, with that said, Let's go to Mark 2. Let's read verses 1 of 4. Let's first start Mark 2, verses 1 of 4. I don't know what the O means. O, J, R, A. O? Okay, Mark 2, verse 1 of 4. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, a paralytic. Sick of the palsy means paralytic. Old English way of saying paralytic, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, because the crowd was blocking the door, and they couldn't penetrate through the crowd, enter through the front door, they uncovered the roof. Look at their zeal. They went to the top of the house, tore open the roof. It's not even their home. Property damage. You know, <clears throat> uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. They brought down the bed where the paralytic lay. Okay, you, watch, you with me so much, so far? So much. As the Holy Spirit guides this conversation, anoints me to speak clearly for the glory of Christ and bless you to understand the meat of Scripture. Okay. Now, with that said, let's read Mark 2, 5. Mark 2, 5. Mark 2, 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, Jesus saw their faith. How do you see faith? Faith is something in your heart. You see faith by your actions. Side note. You see your faith by your actions. Because notice what it says. When Jesus saw their faith. Faith is something in your heart. And I don't have access to what's in your heart. Only God does. But you can manifest what's in your heart, manifest the faith that you have in your heart that's from the Spirit by your deeds, by your actions. That's the point of James chapter 2. Show me your faith. Let me see your faith. Since I can't see your heart to see if you have true faith filling your heart by the Spirit, I can only see the faith that's in your heart by your actions. Right? 
So Jesus saw their faith by their actions. What were their actions? Here's their actions. Nothing will stop us from bringing our friend who's in desperate need of Jesus. Nothing will prevent us from bringing him to Jesus because we know Jesus can heal him. And there'll be no force in creation to stop us from coming to Jesus, even if it means we have to go on top of a roof, tear the roof open. Even the house won't stop us from getting to Jesus. We just got to get to him. And if we get to him, we will be saved because we know who Jesus is. He will never turn us away. He will never turn us back to us if we sincerely seek him with all our heart. You see? You will seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And so Jesus saw their faith because nothing stopped them from reaching him. Nothing stopped them from reaching him. Not even a crowd, not even a roof. Because they knew you have the power to heal our friend. And we'll do everything we can to reach you because we know you will never turn us away. Isn't it beautiful? It even moves me in my heart. <clears throat> it really does. I pray the Lord purify our hearts to have genuine love, deep passion, love for Jesus. You see how much faith they had? I want that to sink in. They knew who Jesus was, that he would never turn them away. They had no doubt, if we just get to him, he will bless us. He will heal our friend. He will never turn us away because they knew the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament says, you will seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And so Jesus saw their faith and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. May we all have those kind of friends that will do everything in their power to bring their loved ones to Jesus. May we all be surrounded by such brothers and sisters, by such friends. May we all have those kind of friends, those kind of brothers, those kind that will do everything in their power to bring us to Jesus, to bring people to Jesus. And may we be that kind of friend, that kind of brother, that kind of sister to another. If I can only bring him to Jesus, if I can only bring her to Jesus, right? So, but now coming back to the issue, Mark 2, 5. Let's read it one more time. Yes, hermano. I love that. I love that Spanish word, hermano. Mark 2, 5. One more time, Jesus saw their faith. And he said, this moves me in my spirit right now. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. May the Lord purify my heart. Never to be a crowd pleaser, but from my heart, show love for Jesus and love for you. But this moves me right here because it says when he saw their faith, <clears throat> he, they, he saw how much they loved their friend. <clears throat> See, it moves me, right? Here we got someone whose mother was a whore who says Jesus and blasphemes Jesus because he's upset that his mother's a whore. Send this demon to his father, the devil. Sorry, guys, this guy just mocked Jesus. So that's why I called him what he is. But that's the devil right there to try to rain on our parade. But isn't it amazing? When Jesus saw the love of this man's friends, how much they loved him, right? He goes, son, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that beautiful? Your sins are forgiven. Wow. To see how much they loved their friend, that nothing would stop them from reaching Jesus. Lord, our friend needs you. <clears throat> I'm telling you, it moves me in my spirit. Our friend needs you, Lord. Only you and you alone can heal him and meet his needs. Lord. We bring our friend to you. Please <clears throat> heal him, Lord. Heal him. <clears throat> Isn't that beautiful? Right? If only we can love that way. Now, when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Son, 
Your sins are forgiven you. Pay attention. Your sin, sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven. Now let's read Mark 2, 6 to 9. Mark 2, 6 to 9. Mark 2, 6 to 9. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Notice, reasoning in their hearts, not verbalizing it, saying it within themselves. Pay attention. What do they say? Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Only God can forgive sins. Why is this man blaspheming? Now notice Jesus. Pay attention. Mark 2, 8 to 9. Guys, pay attention. This is where the meat's going to come out. And immediately, immediately, instantaneously, when Jesus perceived, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, they weren't verbalizing it, they were thinking it in their own hearts, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Okay, before I move on, notice two things about Jesus right away. Two things. Jesus has the power to forgive sins. And Jesus knows what people are thinking in their hearts when they think it. But notice how Mark articulates it in 2.8. Immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit. This is Mark's way of referring to Jesus' divine nature. How do I know? Because in John 4, 24, Jesus says, God is spirit. God's nature is spirit. Right? So when John says, Jesus immediately knew what they were thinking in their hearts in his spirit, that's Mark's way of saying, by virtue of his divine nature, being God, as God, he knew what they're thinking in their hearts. In his spirit, in reference to his divine nature, he knew what they were thinking in their hearts. Did you guys catch it? Did it sink in? This is Mark's way of referring to the divine nature of Christ. Showing you that Mark is aware that Christ is God-man. He is divine and human. And in reference to his divine nature, Jesus is spirit. In his spirit, in relation to his divine nature as God, he knows what you're thinking within yourselves. And he'll expose your thoughts. Let's look at Mark 2, 8 to 10 again. Mark 2, verses 8 to 10. Catch it. And this is going to help us understand Mark 13, 32. Immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit, if I were to express it today in today's language and theology, immediately, Jesus perceived in respect to his divine nature. As God, in his divine nature, in his divine mind, he... he Heard what they were thinking in their hearts. Okay. That they so reason within themselves. He said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Why are you talking within yourselves as if I can't hear what you're saying to yourself, within yourself, in your heart? You still don't know who I am, do you? Whether is it easier? No, not the Holy Spirit. Paul Simons. Let me try this again. Don't make this mistake. When it says in his spirit, it means his own divine nature, not the Holy Spirit. Don't make that mistake again. I'll excuse your ignorance for now. Whether is it easier to say the sick of the palsy to the sick of the palsy? What's easier to say to the paralytic? Is it easier to say to him, thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, arise, take up thy bed and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately he got up and walked. Now, notice what Jesus is saying. What's his point? It's easy for me to say, hey, Protestant, your sins are forgiven. Anyone can say that. You can't prove or disprove that, right? Anyone can say that. How are you going to prove or disprove it? But if Protestant believer is paralyzed and I say, hey, rise and walk, that I can't get away with. Because if I say to him, rise and walk, and he doesn't walk, I'm busted. I just expose myself as a charlatan, as a fake, as a quack. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to do what you think is the harder thing to do. Heal him physically. 
And when he's healed physically, that will be miraculous proof that I can do what you cannot see with your eyes. Forgive him spiritually. Heal him spiritually. You understand Jesus' point? My ability to heal him physically will be miraculous proof of my ability to heal him and everyone else spiritually. My ability to heal his physical disease will be the miraculous proof and confirmation of my ability to heal him of his spiritual disease. Paul Simons, this is kind of too much for him. It's above his pay grade. Send him, uh, send him out of here. It's too much for this guy. Sorry, Paul. Find another channel. This is not for you, bro. Sorry about that. Please send him out of here. Thank you. Hide him, Angela. Not unhide him. Okay. Okay. Uh, Philip, which part of when I said that when I'm answering question, don't ask me another question, not related topic, wasn't clear. The don't ask me or the another question. Okay. Is everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? Did you get it so far? What the miracle confirmed, what the miracle proved? The physical miracle proved that Jesus is able to forgive sins. My ability to miraculously heal him physically is confirmation of my ability to heal him spiritually, of his spiritual disease. But now notice three things about Jesus in Mark 2. Three things. He knows what people are thinking in their hearts. He forgives all sins and heals all diseases. Let me repeat it. He knows what people think in their hearts within themselves. He forgives all sins and heals all diseases. Okay. 1 Kings 8, 39. 1 Kings 8, 39. I hope this is blessing you. I hope this is exciting you. I hope it's blowing you away. How real our God is. How real and beautiful Jesus is. How real this Bible is. If you understand it. 1 Kings 8, 39. Read with me, folks. 1 Kings 8, 39. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do. And give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou only, you only knowest the hearts of all children of men. Solomon praying to Jehovah says, forgive sins on earth, and you know, and only you know the hearts of men. So Jehovah forgives sins, and he alone knows the hearts of men. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Angelo Toro, I don't know if his paralysis is because of sin, because the text doesn't give us enough background information. But what the point of the text is, is this. Angelo Toro, the point of the text is this. What's more important? Jesus heals you physically or heals you spiritually? Because you can be healed physically and still remain spiritually diseased and on your way to hell. So by forgiving his sins, Jesus shows us what's the number one priority to God. God's chief priority now is to heal you of your spiritual disease. So when you're cleansed of your sin, then you'll enjoy the full benefits of what Christ has done in the age to come. Because in the age to come, because your sins are forgiven, you'll be given physical bodies that are immortal, incorruptible, disease-free, pain-free, death-free, deathless bodies. So we're not told that he's paralyzed because of his sin. But the reason why Jesus forgives his sins is because there the Bible writers are showing you what's priority for now. God's chief priority now is to heal you of your spiritual disease. Then in the age to come, those who are healed, healed spiritually and forgiven, then they will be given physical bodies that are incorruptible, indestructible, where you'll be made morally incorruptible, Pain-free, death-free, deathless, disease-free. So if you ask God, God, what's more important now in this age? Waiting for the age to come. To heal someone of cancer or to heal someone of sin? God would say, because he said it in his word, I can heal someone of their cancer and they still remain in their sins and they go to hell. So of what benefit? 
Or I can heal someone spiritually, forgive them their sins, and they suffer cancer and die, enter my presence, and then the age to come, their bodies will be reconstructed, recreated, resurrected, now made immortal, indestructible, where cancer and death can never touch those bodies again. Which is more important? Their bodies reconstructed, recreated, resurrected to become immortal, incorruptible, where cancer did not touch those bodies again. In Jesus' name, bless this connection, Lord. Is that clear? So let me repeat my answer to the question. We are not told the man's paralysis is because of his sin. Maybe, maybe not. Because not all diseases is because of sins we have committed. If I get cancer, it's not because of some sin I did and God is punishing me or allowed, uh, allowing me to be punished. So we need to be careful of that. Is that clear? So let me repeat that again because I believe someone needs to hear this. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, guiding this conversation for the glory of Christ. What's more important? To heal someone of cancer and that person remains in his or her sins? Or to heal someone of their spiritual disease cleanse them of their sins and end up dying of cancer physically, only to answer the presence of God in a state of peace and rest, awaiting the resurrection of their bodies. And at the end of the age, when their bodies are resurrected, then they will have physical bodies that are cancer-free, disease-free. Okay. So, that's the point of Mark 2. That's the point of Mark 2. Jesus went to the heart of the matter. This man needs to be cleansed of his spiritual disease more so than his physical ailment. So he met what was the most crucial need of the man. The most important need, the most crucial need of the man was forgiveness so he can be reconciled to God. Then all the rest will follow. Is that clear? Did that sink in? Okay. So don't forget what Jesus did. Healed the man of his disease, forgave the man his sins, and knew what people are thinking in their hearts. So now again, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For Jehovah searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he'll be found of thee. Do you remember what I said? They were seeking Jesus with their whole heart and they found him. So notice what David says to Solomon. Guys, tie this in with Jesus. David says to Solomon, right? God knows all the imaginations of the hearts of a man. He knows all the thoughts of a, the hearts of a man. And Solomon, if you seek Jehovah, your God, with all your heart, you'll be found of him. He will find you. You will find him. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now, tied in sin with Jesus. Four men brought a paralyzed man, seeking Jesus with all their heart, and they were found by Jesus. And that same Jesus healed the man of his disease, forgave him his sins, and knew the imaginations of the thoughts of the men around him. Sure sounds like Jesus is the God of Solomon, the God of David, the God of the Psalter. Right? But it gets better. Psalm 44, verse 21. Psalm 44, verse 21. Who's blaspheming? I don't get it. Psalm 44, verse 21. Pay attention to the benefits. From Jehovah, Psalm 44, verse 21. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Jehovah knoweth the secrets of the heart. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 4. Catholic, I really don't need your approval to tell me good one or not. Just sit and enjoy the ride and listen. Psalm 103, 2 to 4. Bless Jehovah, O my, o my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice, praise him for all the benefits you've experienced from Jehovah. What are the benefits? Here are the benefits. 
who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with love and kindness and tender mercies. Wow. Jehovah benefits us by healing all our diseases, forgives all our sins, redeems our life from the pit, who knows the hearts of men, and he alone knows the hearts of all men. And yet Jesus forgives all diseases, I'm sorry, all sins, and heals all diseases and knows what men are thinking in their hearts. Why does Mark 2 portray Jesus as exhibiting the qualities and characteristics that the Old Testament ascribed to Jehovah? Like Jehovah, Jesus heals all diseases in Mark 2. Like Jehovah, Jesus forgives all sins in Mark 2. Like Jehovah, Jesus knows what people are thinking in their hearts. And like Jehovah, Jesus ransoms souls by his soul, by his life. Mark 10, verse 45. Mark 10, verse 45. Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, folks, did you, did you see how much meat there was in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12? Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Did you see... How much meat in Mark 2, verses 1 to 12? In Mark, Jesus knows the thoughts of men. And he does so because of his spirit, meaning divine nature. In Mark, Jesus heals diseases and forgives sins, all of which these passages in the Old Testament ascribe to Jehovah God. And you're trying to tell me that in Mark 1 and Mark 2, Mark hasn't gone out of his way to identify Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh? By ascribing to Jesus the characteristics, the functions, the abilities, and even passages that speak about Jehovah to Jesus. So by the time I get to Mark 2, I'll fail to see that Mark is describing Jesus as the God-man, Jehovah in the flesh, long before I get to Mark 13. That's what Mark is trying to do. Or is Mark trying to set a case from Mark 1? That this Jesus is God in the flesh, Jehovah in the flesh, the God of the Old Testament who appears in the flesh, the divine Son of God, one with the Father and the Spirit who's truly human. Is it sinking in how I'm building my case? Exactly. If my meager words and my weak, imperfect preaching is blowing you away, Imagine what will happen when you see the physical face, the glorified, resurrected physical body of Jesus, who's the fullness of God in the flesh standing before you. Then you'll really know what it's like to be blown away. Now, before I move on to Mark 13, 32, have I made a case like I did with Matthew yesterday? Like I did with Matthew yesterday. Have I made a case? From Mark, the first two chapters, Mark has begun the gospel identifying Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty of Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 40 verse 3. The one who does what the Old Testament says only Jehovah does, pour out the spirit, forgive sins, heal all diseases, and knows the thoughts of every man, what they're thinking in their hearts. If I've made the case... Then I can go to Mark 13.32 and wrap things up with Mark 13.32. But I, I want to give you a moment for it to sink in, that you absorb this, you understand it, because I want this to be the most comprehensive, thorough explanation of what it means for the Son not to know the day or hour. Yeah, Jeremiah. What do I do with people like you? So the Father gave Jesus the authority to do what only Jehovah does, which is why Mark quotes passages about Jehovah and applies it to Jesus, identifying Jesus as the Jehovah of Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3 because the Father gave him authority. Are you serious and ask me that question, brother? No, it's that you can't answer the question on your own is what's killing me. So Malachi 
that's about Jehovah coming to his temple. Isaiah 40, verse 3, that's about Jehovah, Israel's God, coming. Applied to Jesus, thereby identifying Jesus as that Jehovah God of the Old Testament. And you still don't know how to answer a Jehovah Witness who says, the Father gave him the authority to forgive sins. So the Father gave Jesus the authority to do what only Jehovah does, thereby identifying the Son as Jehovah. Do I really need to answer that for you, bro? honestly? Do I really need to answer that question for you, seriously? And again, I have to blame pastors and churches for the level of biblical illiteracy and the inability of Christians to even answer such an easy objection. It really is disgusting. It sickens me that someone can't answer such an objection. Well, the Father gave him the authority. Okay, so Jesus gives the authority to the disciples to do miracles. That means now I can identify the disciples as Jehovah God Almighty or as Jesus Christ in the flesh. You see what a stupid objection that is? And it's killing me that you can't refute it. Right? Jesus gave the apostles the authority to do miracles and preach the forgiveness of sins. So using the logic of the Jehovah Witness, the disciples, the apostles, are now Jehovah God, can be called Jehovah God, or could be called Jesus Christ, because they are being, being given authority to do miracles and proclaim forgiveness of sins. And the Jehovah Witness would laugh at me, say, man, stupid. No, just because they have the authority to do it doesn't mean you can call them that. Then why is Jesus called Jehovah God? Why is he identified as Jehovah God? Why are Old Testament passages about the coming of Jehovah applied to him? You see how easy it is to refute that nonsense? But the fact that you can't, it's killing me, man. It's killing me. What is happening to the church today that we can't answer such a basic objection? A stupid objection. Giving someone authority doesn't give that one the right to be described and identified as God Almighty. Because that authority was given to prophets to preach and do miracles and the apostles, but none of them were called Jehovah God and none of them had Old Testament passages about Jehovah appearing applied to them. And you need me to answer that question? Pins and needles, needles and pins. Happy man's a man that grins. Okay. Did everyone get it? Let's get biblical. How do you know he is a new Christian for you to chime in? Let's get biblical. Let's get lost. How about that, buddy? Can we send our friend, let's get biblical somewhere? See you, friend. I love you. It was nice to have you while we did. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. And just to correct, let's get lost. Jeremiah 15, 16 has been here before. It's not his first time. Confirm to everyone, Jeremiah 15, verse 16. This is not your first time. You've been here before asking me such questions. Confirm it because I remember you. Bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. You know I'm not going to win any popularity contest. So you got it? So you tell let's get lost. Don't chime in and be a hero because then you're going to be a zero. All right. All right. With that said, repeat with what? Oh, about that? Okay. Let me repeat for, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Tetunian. He asked me, how would I respond to Joe Witness that the Father gave Jesus authority to do these things? Okay. Giving Jesus the authority to do what only Jehovah does. Why would the Father give Jesus authority to do that which only Jehovah does if he's not Jehovah? That's number one. Number two. With that said, giving Jesus authority to do things doesn't mean that Old Testament passages that speak of Jehovah God coming and appearing can be applied to Jesus because the apostles were sent out with the authority of Jesus to do miracles in Jesus' name and to preach the message of forgiveness through the preaching of the gospel. But does that mean that I can now apply passages above of Jehovah to the disciples or passages about Jesus to the disciples or start calling the disciples Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or God the Father in the flesh? Of course not. That's stupid. That's stupid. Giving you authority doesn't mean you have the right to be identified with the person that you represent if you're not that person. 
or you don't share the, the being of that person. In other words, if I send you out with my authority, speak on my behalf, you can't go around saying, hey, I'm Sam Shamoon. And no one can then say, hey, there goes Sam Shamoon. Just because I gave you authority, I authorize you to speak on my behalf and do things in my name. Does that give people the right to then identify you as me or give you the right to speak as if you're me? So how does this then justify Jesus being identified as Jehovah God and Old Testament passages of Jehovah God appearing applied to Jesus? It doesn't if he's not Jehovah God. That's my point. Okay. You understand now? Okay, Jeremiah, these are bad arguments from Joe's witnesses. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be taken to a higher level that these pathetic, stupid objections, you will decimate with ease because that's they're too stupid. Even when I hear it, I get upset because they're so stupid and so easy to refute. You get my point? That's my frustration. This is one of the stupidest objections someone can bring up. Well, the Father gave Jesus authority. I don't care if the Father authorized Jesus to do the things he did. That still doesn't mean he can be called Jehovah, identified as Jehovah, and passages about Jehovah's coming applied to Jesus' coming, thereby equating Jesus with the Jehovah who was to come. That doesn't work. Right? That's exactly my point, Terp. That's why I'm getting frustrated. Folks, you're Christians. You love Jesus. You're reading the Bible. Why are these stupid arguments so difficult to refute? Why? I don't get it. Come on, man. Listen, I'm not trying to talk down to you. It's because I know that you have the Bible and you're studying it and the Spirit is in you. You should be able to refute these arguments easily. You don't need to be an Einstein or a theologian with a PhD. You don't, man. You don't, honestly. They're that's a pathetic argument. It's like me sending Protestant believer to, to speak on my behalf. Protestant, I authorize you to go represent me at Discord. So he goes to Discord. Can he say, hey, I'm Sam Shamoon? And people say, welcome, Sam Shamoon. No, but why not? I authorize them to go there, speak on my behalf, represent me, and pass my words to them. That still doesn't mean he can be identified as me and call himself me. That does not work. Right? And in that debate Michael Brown, James White had with those Unitarians, I was there asking the question. You'll see me. I asked the question. In that debate, Michael Brown, James White, with those two Unitarian devils, I asked that question. You'll see me. I stand up and ask the question. Sai Christian, you don't need to remember 12 other chapters. You can even rem rem uh, remember a half a verse. Just basic common sense, Sai Christian. Think about it. Your boss authorizes you. You work. Think about an employer, an employee. Your boss authorizes you to ship products for him. You get to your destination, you ship the products for your boss. Can you say, hey, I'm, I'm Joe Schmo. Your boss's name is Joe Schmo. I'm Joe Schmo. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. You work for Joe Schmo. Yeah, stupid, but he authorized me. And because he's authorized me, I'm him, Joe Schmo. Do you really need to be a genius to know that? That that doesn't work? It doesn't work in the world we live in today, and it doesn't work in the Bible. That's why you won't find Isaiah or Moses or Paul going around saying, hey, I'm Jehovah God. Or Paul going around saying, hey, I'm Jesus Christ. No, you're not. Yes, I am Jesus Christ. Paul, you're Paul. Paul of Tarsus. No, dummy. I'm authorized by Jesus. I'm his agent. He authorized me to speak for him so I can be him. So you better start calling me Jesus Christ. You see how stupid that is? I mean, you see how stupid that is? You understand my frustration? 
I mean, you understand, you, you understand my frustration, right? These arguments are so bad and stupid that you should be able to refute them in your sleep. While you're sleeping, <sighs> stupid argument, <sighs> doesn't work. <sighs> you should be able to refute it in your sleep. You get it? That's why it frustrates me. The Father authorized Jesus. That doesn't mean Jesus can be called Jehovah, identified as Jehovah, receive the worship that only Jehovah receives, and do things that only Jehovah can do. That doesn't explain that. Is it clear? And I don't mind taking a moment to explain this because this is important. Jeremiah 15, 16, don't feel I'm trying to put you down. No, I'm not, but I, I'm going to be tough in love to shake you out of complacency and just shake you to start thinking, come on, dude, how bad of an argument is that? Right? Do you guys want me to show you in Scripture where the disciples were authorized by the Father and Son to speak on their behalf so that you can turn this against them? Can I show you those verses? Real quickly, we'll go back to Mark 13, 32. It's okay, rational phobia. And, and the reason why I'm upset, rational phobia, and Jeremiah, not with you. When I see Christians who hunger for the word, who are in love with Jesus and want to know the word, okay, having difficult difficulty answering these objections, my anger is with the pastors. They're a bunch of jokes. You got fat slobs, and I'm not attacking overweight, I'm overweight. Pastors who do nothing but preach the word and they get paid for it, and some of them get hefty salaries where they can be spending hours unpacking this for their congregation. But these lazy fat slobs, these pigs, are not doing their job in teaching the people of God the basics of the faith. So they can be equipped to know their faith, articulate it, and share it, and proclaim it for the glory of the triune God. I'm disgusted with these pastors in America. They disgust me. Right? I went to a mega church, CCV. Went to a mega church. I asked two pastors a basic question of Christianity, and they didn't know how to answer it. And yet you get paid. That's what you do. You get a hefty salary to sit in your beautiful home with your beautiful cars to study the Bible and teach it. And you can't answer this, then what are you getting paid for? Here we are, apologists, struggling to raise up enough support to survive. And we got a corrupt legal system chasing after us because of the immorality of unfaithful spouses. And here you are, hefty salaries, living in a luxurious home where we got to live in a two-bedroom apartment and pray that we can make ends meet every month. And you still are not able to teach your congregation the basics of the faith. You understand my anger now? Why I get angry? CCV is a Christian in one of these mega churches here. The question, Sargon David, was, Joe's witnesses they say the Father authorized Jesus to do these things. That's why he does them. You get my point? It's, it's upsetting, folks. It's upsetting. It's disgusting. It's disgusting, right? They have access. This church I'm talking about has one service at night, three services on Sunday. Thousands line up. And I know people who go there who come out not convicted of their sin. I'm being honest. I saw, listen, I saw a lesbian couple holding hands, walking in that church, leaving the same way they came in. No conviction, holding hands. I know people that go to that church that are shacking up, having sex before marriage. You know that? I know, because I know that. Anyway, yeah. And this is an evangelical church. God have mercy on me. Lord, forgive me for my shortcomings and perfections. Anyway, I hope, hope my rant was still a blessing, and I hope my rant wasn't against the Spirit. May the Spirit forgive me. 
May he guide it for his glory. Yeah. People I know shacking up, having sex before marriage and going there, celebrating Jesus. If that pastor was preaching solid, he'd say, hey, one thing. If you name the name of Jesus, no sex before marriage. And the only, only relationship that God will accept is husband and wife. Coming together in intimacy. And someone who was born male and someone born female not change their gender. That's the only intimate relationship God honors. And that's what we stand for. You're welcome to come, but we don't justify that lifestyle. And we call you to repentance. You don't repent. That's between you and the Lord. But you know where we stand. We stand on the word of God. And if you haven't repented, do not take the Lord's Supper until you repent. Right? This is where we stand. You don't accept it between you and God. But do not take the Lord's Supper. You want to come hear the sermons? Amen. Don't get near the Lord's Supper. And this is where we stand. We call you to repentance. Now you know the truth. That's between you and the Lord. You want to still have sex before marriage? Now you know God disciplined you. You want to justify same-sex relationships? We're telling you that's an abomination to God, but God can change you and forgive you and restore you and love you. If you admit a sin and you turn to him, if not, God deal with you. This is where we stand. Right. Anyway. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Jeremiah. Appreciate it. Because your question... Allowed me to go on this path, and I pray it's from the Spirit, because sometimes we need to hear the call to purity and holiness. And it doesn't mean, doesn't mean, right, I'm living the word perfectly. I struggle. I'm human. I have carnal desires, fleshly desires that I struggle with and, and, and I war with and I hate, right? But one thing I praise God and I ask God to preserve me, never, ever touch a woman sexually. Unless it's in marriage. And the way I'm going, I'm okay with being celibate. As long as God gives me the grace not to burn. Okay. Anyway, sorry about that, guys. I hope it was still a blessing. I hope it was clear. Right? You know, because I'm not hearing, honestly, I'm not hearing in these sessions enough emphasis on sexual purity. I'm not hearing it. Are you? I'm not hearing it. They're there. Men of God are there like Paul Washer, John MacArthur, John Piper. But I'm not hearing it as much as I would like to hear it. Because I know people who are listening to our sessions who are having sex before marriage. And they know it's sin and they're doing it. Anyway. Be that as a... Also, it's strange my name. Jesus' name, Father, Son, Spirit. Bless the connection for your glory in Jesus' name. Okay. Now, I understand the struggle. I understand, I understand because, look, when you've been through a bad divorce with a wicked, immoral spouse, right, who's committed adultery and used the legal system to destroy you, you're afraid of ever getting married again because you have no trust anymore, whether it's a woman who had a bad husband or a man who had a bad wife, like in my case. You're afraid. You don't want to get married because you don't want to go through this again. And yet here you're burning, right? But you can't touch a woman or a man until you get married. So you know what? This is your cross. Carry it. Ask the spirit to crucify your flesh, not to give into it. And endure. Just like, again, let me just say this since I'm on this. I got to make this point. If you have same-sex attraction, if you're struggling with same-sex attraction, if you're burning with same-sex attraction, do not justify it. Do not give into it. Cry out to God saying, God, I know these desires are because of my fallen nature. They're not from you. They're not pleasing to you. Lord, I'm struggling, but I love you more than my desires. Be patient with me. Have mercy on me. Fill me with the spirit and give me the grace to endure 
and to war with this desire and not give in. And he'll show you mercy. He'll show you mercy. Right? He'll show you mercy. If you admit it's sin, and you admit it's unnatural, and you admit it's because of your fallen nature, because you inherit a sinful nature that's tainted your flesh, tainted your thoughts, tainted you physiologically, chemically, spiritually, you acknowledge that, say, no, Lord, I know it's because of the fall. I know I was conceived in sin, meaning because of sin, we inherit a sinful nature that has corrupted us physiologically and spiritually and psychologically and, and emotionally. And you are our great physician and you have the power to heal us and transform us, to make us the way Adam was before Adam sinned and fell. And until you do, this is a struggle, this is my cross, but you're worthy that I died to this desire. You're worthy that I war against it. You're worthy that I don't give in to it and justify it and pervert your word to justify it. You're worthy. Give me grace. Give me your spirit. Give me power. Not to give in to it, not to justify it, and to call it what it is, sin. But that's not just with same-sex desires. That's also for you men, and you know who you are, and you women who burn for the opposite sex. A man burning to have sex with a woman and a woman burning to have sex with a man. You, you dare not justify giving into that desire and sleeping with a woman or a man saying, well, God knows it's a struggle, you know, and I don't want to get married because I don't want to take a chance of being taken to the cleaners again, a corrupt judge destroying me. So I'm just going to give in and have sex here and there. No. You tell the Lord, even though I'm burning, even though I desire the opposite sex, but I know I can't touch a woman or a man until I'm married, I will struggle with this burning desire. I will war against it. I will try to conquer it, crucify it, not give in to it, as long as you give me grace and fill me with the Spirit, because I know it's wrong. And I acknowledge you're right, it's wrong for me to indulge in it if I'm not married. Hope that's clear. Exactly, Andrew Martin. Hope that's clear. So, Jeremiah, thank you. And I trust this was from the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that this conversation was guided by you and anointed by you for the glory of Jesus. Okay? And, folks, I burn too. I burn too. And Paul says, if you burn, find your wife. I'm too afraid to get married again. So I'm asking God, remove this burning and give me the gift of celibacy. And if you don't remove it, give me the grace. I will never touch a woman sexually unless it's in marriage. And until I get married, which I don't plan on getting married, I'm just going to burn and fight and struggle until Jesus takes me home. Amen, Grandmaster, amen. So this is the second time I brought up this subject. And, and it wasn't planned. I didn't plan it. I didn't plan it. But I do trust it was the Holy Spirit's plan. You know why? That means the Holy Spirit wanted someone to hear this. There's someone there who's probably struggling with same-sex attractions or sexually active. And here and she knows they're not supposed to. And the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear this message loud and clearly. Right? So you know who you are. I don't, you know, and when I say you know who you are, I'm, I'm, and there's probably someone here thinking that I'm talking about them because I may know them. No, 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 no. I'm speaking honestly. There's someone here. That's another topic, Jamal Williams. After long, intense study, the answer is yes. If a spouse has been sexually immoral, you are free to remarry, but I'm going to teach that because you have Christians now saying, no, you cannot remarry until a spouse dies. And then they condemn those who disagree with them and call them adulterers. That's why I lost a few people from the channel because I went after them for that position. And one sister in particular, and she knows who she is. I won't mention her name. I went after her for that, you know, because if you don't agree with them, 
uh, divorce and remarriage. Then they start accusing of being adulterers and adulteresses because of their myopic perversion of scripture. Anyway, Lord willing in time. Now, with that said, with that said, coming back to the issue, I'm going to have to do a part three. You know that, right? I'm going to have to do a part three. Okay. No, Ezekiel 2, 9, 3, 3. Philip, drop it. Stop quoting Ezekiel 2, 9 about Jesus. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Please stop quoting Ezekiel 2, 9 to chapter 3, verse 3. It has its historical fulfillment in God abandoning Jerusalem by handing the Jews over to Babylonian captivity, bringing the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem and the temple, and then God having mercy upon them by then bringing them back into the land, once again, to rebuild the temple, and then him dwelling with them. But it, it's not about Jesus coming. Not Ezekiel 2, verse 9 to chapter 3, verse 3. That's misapplication. Stop quoting that about Jesus' physical coming to the temple in Jerusalem. Okay? Everyone clear now? Is that clear? So far, what we've discussed was clear. Now, coming back to the point, George Wagner, I'm sorry that I can't do things according to your timetable and that I can't make you happy because all of this session is focused on you, George Wagner, and forget everyone else, forget the other issues that we're pressing in my heart to address. Can you forgive me, George Wagner? Will you forgive me? That I can't live up to your expectations, uh, George? I just want to know. Please forgive me, brother. Because I exist to make you happy, brother. It was George Wagner, not, not George Vanderbilt. Sorry. Okay. With that said, let's go back to the main point of Mark. Main point of Mark. Don't you love these live streams? Because you don't know how the Holy Spirit will guide the conversation. I plan one thing, and the Holy Spirit takes over and says, your plans do not matter. My plans matter, and I will have you say what I want you to say as long as we give it to the Spirit and yield it to the Spirit, and the Spirit takes over and protects me from error so that Jesus will be glorified. <clears throat> okay, now, to recap Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 2. Was it clear from Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 2 that Jesus is identified as Jehovah God Almighty of the Hebrew Bible? Jesus is identified as Jehovah God Almighty of the Hebrew Bible. Old Testament texts about Jehovah God appearing apply to Jesus. Forgiving sins, knowing what people think in their hearts, healing diseases are the functions attributed to Jehovah, and Jesus performs all those functions. Giving the Holy Spirit to believers, pouring out the Holy Spirit upon believers, immersing believers in the presence of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus does, is something the Old Testament says only Jehovah does. So is it clear from just from the first two chapters, Mark has identified Jesus as the Son of the Father, who is one with the Father in essence, which is why the Son, like the Father, is Jehovah God in union with the Spirit. So that Mark has now identified Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh, the God man. Was that clear? Was that clear? I'll probably have to do a part three, Lord willing, on this because we're close to two hours. And a lot of people don't love marathon sessions, and a lot do. Pray we get more subscribers, more likes, and that God will keep me going and empower me for his glory to do this as long as he wants me to do it. Let's go now to Mark 13, 32. Mark 13, 32. I'm going to have to do a part four. I said part three, part four, sorry. This is part three, right? No, no, this is part two. This is the third live Q&A for this week, but this is part two in answering the question, why doesn't the sun know the day or hour? So I'm going to do a third part on that question in my fourth live Q&A session, God willing. <clears throat> okay. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the son, but the father. So now let me unpack this. Let me unpack this. Of the day or hour knoweth no man, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father. Okay. In the biblical worldview, 
in the understanding of the Bible writers, when you speak of humans and angels, you're speaking of the entirety of creation. Here, the word angels, that word angels is being used in a generic sense to include all spirit creatures that dwell in heaven. It's generic. It means all spirit creatures that dwell in heaven before the presence of God in heaven. So now, let me unpack this because you got to get this. You got to get this. Okay. When you say humans and angels, as far as the Bible is concerned, that's all creation. That's the entire world of creation, the entire created order, right? Angels and humans means all of creation because in creation, spirit creatures and human creatures are the two groups of creatures that the Bible speaks of having the ability to have intimate communion with God. Sentient beings, beings who are aware of their existence and God's existence and either they're in fellowship with God or rebellion with God, right? I'm trying to simplify things because even animals are sentient beings. They do have awareness, right? They have, you know, it's complex. But well, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. And here is the point. Angels and humans, as far as the Bible is concerned, that's all creation. When you speak of angels and humans, you're talking about the entire created order because the Bible focuses on angelic and human creatures and their relationship to God. Animals are mentioned, but they're not the focus, right? Insects, birds, animals, marine life, sea life, they are not the focus of the Bible. The focus of the Bible is humans and then angels in their relationship to God and humans. Everyone with me there? You understand what I'm getting at? So when you say humans and angels, you're saying all creation. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. I want to unpack this point. And Lord willing, part 3, I'll unpack Mark 13, 32 even more tomorrow, God willing. Okay, let's see. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. For I think that God hath set, us for, set forth us apostles. I think that God has set forth us apostles. Last. As it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. You see what the world is? The world is angels and men. So the world is seeing us like a spectator sport as, we, as we're being offered up to death. And the spectators are angels and men. So the world, the created order, the cosmos that's created includes angels and men. So angels and men, angels and humans make up the created order, right? Right? Did you get it? Now, another point to keep in mind. Unless God chooses to appear visibly to humans on earth, unless God chooses to speak audibly to humans on earth where they hear his voice audibly and see him visibly, God, for all intents and purposes, remains hidden from humans on earth. From humans on earth. Okay? Matthew 6, 6 and Matthew 6, 18. Let me explain the point of Jesus here. Matthew 6, 6 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 and verse 18. Me? Make a Bible study me? With notes? Chapter 6, verse 6 and verse 18. Remind me to let you in a little secret. I did finish a commentary. Okay. Now what? read with me. Matthew 6, verse 6 and verse 18. But thou, when thou prayest, in Jesus' name, God. Let's see the connection over. It's buffering for me. Thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. Which is in secret. Did you catch it? which is in secret. So your father's in secret, hidden from you in a secret place you don't see, right? Your father, which is in secret, and thy father, which sees, reward thee openly. Now, Matthew 6, 18, right? Matthew 6, 18. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father in secret, 
And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In Jesus' name, bless the connection, Lord. Keep it strong so they can get the point. Yeah, hold on. You got it? You see what Matthew 6, 6 and 18 stated? God the Father is hidden in secret. Humans do not see him visibly and don't hear his voice audibly unless he wants to remove the veil and you see him visibly and hear him audibly, right? Sorry, guys. It just keeps buffering. It's buffering right at an important point. Can you believe it? Say, so everyone got that part or no? Okay, everyone got that part? Yeah, I don't know why it's buffering. I can't move on unless you get the point. So if you got the point, humans on earth do not see God visibly or hear his voice audibly. God can appear visibly and you can hear him audibly, but that's rare. That's not common. For the most part, he remains hidden. Okay, now, 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. Okay, watch here. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. Hey, Megatron, can you send him to uh, university school for medicine? Because he's talking about cranial and all these things. Can you send him out of here? 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23. And he said, hear thou, therefore, send him out here. Hear thou, therefore, the word of Jehovah. Hear now, thou, therefore, the word of Jehovah. Micaiah speaking. I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne. So Micaiah was given the grace to see heaven. He was allowed to see in heaven. Grace given to him because he's a seer, he's a prophet. What does he see in heaven? Pay attention. What does he see in heaven? I saw the Lord Jehovah, I saw the Lord Jehovah, right? Doing what? Let's see. <laughs> Sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Pay attention. Host of heaven, right and left. And Jehovah said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit. And stood before Jehovah and said, I will persuade him. And Jehovah said unto him, wherewith? How? How are you going to do it? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him. Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now, therefore, behold, Jehovah had put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets, thy prophets, your false prophets. And Jehovah had spoken evil concerning thee. No, Medic, it's my mother's fault because, Medic, you've been here for a while and you still don't care for the rules. Play video games. Talk about medicine and cranial. Forget the word of God. Forget about the Trinity. Forget about Mark 13, 32. Forget it. Medic. Let's just talk about medicine. Right? And your fault, someone else gets kicked out. All right. Now, everyone, did you get what happens in heaven? What do you say to this guy who's constantly making mistakes and constantly saying, I'm sorry? Okay. What, do you, what do you tell this guy? What do I tell someone who's already been banned because he was disrespectful to the rules and distracted and he does it again? What do I tell someone? I need to find another line of work. It's not good for my health. All right. Did you guys get it? First Kings 22, 19 and 23. Despite the fact we're allowing the devil to distract us and be a distraction. Anyway. Do you guys get it? In heaven, the angelic host see God visibly, hear God audibly, and they communicate directly with God. Do you get that part? Despite medic's distraction to distract me, so I end up distracting you guys. Okay. Now you're going to appreciate Jesus' point. Jesus is saying, of the day or hour, no man knows. Well, that's a given. Man on earth does not see God visibly, does not hear God audibly. God remains hidden. So 
it's to be expected that human beings would not know the their hour unless God made it known to them. But now angels in heaven are different. They're there in heaven. They see God visibly. They hear God audibly and they speak to him directly. They don't even know. Do you understand what Jesus is saying now? Do you appreciate the depth of Jesus' statement? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. The depth of Jesus' statement. Philip, send Philip somewhere else, my friend. Philip, it's too much for you, brother, this class. Send our friend Philip here. God, God bless you, Philip. Uh, and I know there's a YouTube channel waiting for you. Yeah. You got it? Okay. Human beings don't know the dare hour. That's to be expected. Why don't they know the dare hour? Because God is hidden to them. They don't hear God audibly. They don't see him visibly. But even the angels don't know the dare hour. Even though they're there in heaven, they see God visibly and they hear God audibly. They see God visibly and hear God audibly. They don't even know. If anyone would know, it would be the angels because they're there beholding God visibly, hearing him audibly. Unlike humans, they don't even know. God hasn't told them. As close as they are to God, he hasn't told them. Now, as far as the Bible is concerned, that's all creatures. Even the highest of creatures who are closest proximity to God, who see God visibly and hear him audibly, they don't even know. Oh, but there's still one more. Nor the Son. Mark 13, 32. Nor the Son. Mark 13, 32. If you understood the Bible and understood Jesus' point, you would sit in awe of who Jesus claimed to be in Mark 13, 32. Let's look at Mark 13, 32. It would actually blow you away who he just claimed to be. Humans don't know. God is into them. They don't see him visibly. They don't hear him audibly. Nor do the angels know, though they see God visibly and hear him audibly. Well, that's all creatures. Ah, neither does the sun. So notice it's in ascending order from the lowest to the highest. Lowest on the wrong are humans. Higher are angels. Higher still is the son, and notice his relationship. He is the son to the father. None of them are called the son. He alone is the son to the father. Everything else is a creature. See what he just did? Do you see what he just did? The very passage that people think refute Jesus' deity actually confirms it. Lowest on the wrong, humans. Higher on the wrong, angels. That's all creation. But there's one higher still. And he truly is the son of the father. Neither the son but the father. So wait, Jesus. You called yourself the son. You didn't call them the son. Yes, because they are creatures Whereas I am the son of the father. I am the true son of the father, higher than all creatures. So even here, Jesus, you're showing that you transcend all creatures. You're higher than all creatures. And you are the father's true son and belong to the same category that the father belongs to. Yes. And that's why it's shocking that even the son, who's not a creature, who's higher than all creatures, higher than all angelic creatures, higher than all human creatures, and he's the son to the father, the true son of the father, even he doesn't know. Wow. You understand the reaction you're supposed to get? You understand that this saying actually shows that Jesus believes he's superior to all creation, and that he is the true son of the father. Note, the angels are not said to be God's sons. The humans here are not said to be God's sons. Jesus is the son in contrast to angels and humans because they are mere creatures, whereas he is the son on the same category and level with the father. I have no idea what you're saying. Okay, I was wrong about it. So even what's taken to be a denial of his deity is actually an affirmation of his deity. Superior to all creation, the true son of God, the son of the father, 
So he is on the father's side of things. Angels and humans are on one side, the created side. The son is on the father's side of the creator-creature divide, even in this statement of Jesus. Everyone got it? Because now this will prepare you, Lord Jesus willing, for part three tomorrow. This will prepare you, Lord Jesus willing, for part three tomorrow. But you got to go back, re-listen to part one, re-listen to this, to be prepared for part three. I told you I'm going to make the most thorough exposition of what Jesus meant when he said, the son doesn't know the dare hour, because now you should have seen ample proof from Matthew and Mark, explicit, irrefutable proof. Jesus is no mere creature. He is Jehovah God of the Old Testament, Jehovah God Almighty, who became man, who became flesh, the God man, divine and human, one with the Father and the Spirit, all from Matthew and Mark. So Lord willing, Lord willing, part three tomorrow. Part three on this question, Keldium. It'll be my fourth live and Q&A session, but part three on the subject of why Jesus didn't know the dare hour. But before you go, you're going to have to watch this video, YouTube video, to prepare you for tomorrow. Let me give you the link. I'll give you the link. You need to watch this because this is going to be part of my response, okay? Let me get you the video. Here it goes. You must watch this, okay? Lord willing, here's the link. Watch it. Oh, sorry. Oh, so not a lot. My man, I Let me give you the link again. Watch this video tomorrow. It's about hypnosis. Watch it for tomorrow's session, meaning you don't watch it tomorrow. Watch it for tomorrow's session to be ready for tomorrow's session. So get ready for tomorrow. Pray for me and my daughters. Pray for miraculous deliverance from these satanic shackles. Miraculous deliverance. That I'll be completely free to serve Jesus and that the Lord will plant me for his glory. Take me to a higher level of holiness, love, devotion, and worship, and wisdom, and knowledge, and faithfulness. Bless my daughters abundantly. Bring them to me and provide for the ministry. I move in my new place February 15. Pray for those provisions to do the ministry. Because the way I'm going, I'm losing more people than I'm keeping. And I don't want to ever compromise or prostitute myself for money. God saved me to never compromise for money. Never. God, in Jesus' name, keep me holy and do it for his glory and to be a man of integrity. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. The Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. We worship you. Wash us in your blood. Wash our loved ones in your blood. Wash my daughters in your blood. Fill us with the Spirit and have mercy on us, Lord. Save us from the evil one in Jesus' name. Part three on this question. Here's the link to the video again. Watch it for tomorrow's session. Get ready. Christ is amazing. The Bible is amazing. The Bible is his word. The Bible is true. The God of the Bible is real. Christ is alive. He is risen. And he will come again. May he come sooner than later. Yeah, tomorrow, Lord willing, Terb, around the same time. Look for me around 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. Canadian New York Time. Eastern Standard Time, God willing. Take care. Lord bless you.